Vice Chair of the Legal Services Corporation, and I have the unlucky uh, uh, task of following some tremendously great speakers. One of the words that I heard uh, Paulette Brown use is we. It's also a word that uh, we heard from the Secretary of the Army. The recognition that the issues that bring us here today are, are issues that bring us together, that don't divide us, is uh, going to be the theme of my one-minute opening remarks, <laughs> uh, which is that it's uh, originally the we was bipartisan. The creation of the Legal Services Corporation was bipartisan. Uh, today, it's not just that, it's the we of uh, all the sectors of society, and that includes business as well as law. That includes the wealthy as well as the poor. That includes people in the South as well as people in the North, et cetera, et cetera. So Harriet Myers, White House counsel to President George W. Bush, recently recognized by the Dallas Bar as an exemplar for the profession, she said this, lawyers especially have an obligation to give back to society, to defend the rule of law, to work to improve our legal system, and to take steps to ensure that all of our citizens, including the most vulnerable among us, have access to the justice system. A year ago, Chief Judge Merrick Garland said at our meeting right here in the White House, the legitimacy of the rule of law depends on equal justice. Equal justice depends on equal access, and so in the end, the rule of law depends on the thousands of men and women who do the extraordinarily difficult work of provision of legal services to those in need. I invite everyone here to recognize everyone here who does anything for legal services. <laughs> And specifically here, I am so honored to be with people who have, I think, the busiest lives on the planet, and they have made the time to be here. That speaks volumes about who's the we. And we really have no time together, but I'm going to actually ask everyone two questions, and I'm going to give a warm call, not a cold call, to my friend Ken Frazier. You're going to be the first one up. Uh, and I will introduce each person as I move up and down the line. There are really two questions, and you can answer either of them or neither of them. And the questions <laughs> are, why does this matter to you personally, to business, to America? Why does legal services matter? And the second is, what lessons can business offer legal services? How can we do what we do better? Um, Ken Frazier, just so you, you know who you are, but I get to say who you are. So Ken Frazier uh, is uh, the remarkable chair and CEO of Merck. Uh, he is himself one of the most outstanding public servants serving right now in the President's Export Council, involved in the ABA, the ALI, the Cornerstone Christian Academy, NLADA, where he was chair and exemplar, pro bono, uh, and, and let me just say, your willingness to be the new co-chair of the council that John Levy described just speaks, again, volumes about you and your outstanding words at the Legal Services 40th. So now I hope that's enough of a, a, a time for you to figure out what you're going to say. Thank you, Dean Minow. Uh, it's great to be here, and I want to thank the president for making this forum available to us. So I'll start by saying why access to legal services is important. Our business, of course, is a health care business, and like health care, Law is an issue that doesn't matter unless people have access to it. It's critical for people to have access. It's the central issue as far as I'm concerned. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it's the threshold issue that allows people to have access to health care and other public benefits. So it's critical for us to recognize that access is important. As a business, I think we have a huge stake in social cohesion. And if people begin to feel that they don't have a stake in our society, if they believe that the rules that, it, that of engagement in the American society, the things that we were taught in grammar school about America no longer apply, then you worry about the center not holding. We see extremes of income inequality in our country nowadays, and it's critical, it's growing worse, and I think we have to recognize that of all the institutions, it is the lawyers who actually are best positioned to address some of those issues. We can't ask Congress to enact legislation to do anything about it. Our Supreme Court, I think it's sad to say, has not really been particularly responsive to the issues that people deal with in their day-to-day -day lives, how they work, how they interact with each other, the services that they need. So it's critical for those of us who are involved with legal services to make sure that we provide the kind of access to justice that will be important. Without it, I think there will be a lack of trust, and those of us who run business know that the most precious asset that we have on our balance sheet is the public trust. 
Wow, excellent. Amy Schulman will be next. And Amy is CEO of Arisa Therapeutics and Lindra. She's a partner in Polaris, which is a healthcare venture investment. She was the path-breaking vice president and general counsel of Pfizer, where she actually transformed how uh, companies relate to outside counsel and head of the consumer health business there. She teaches at Harvard Business School. She teaches at Harvard Law School. She's a vibrant leader. She's passionate about service, and she's my friend. Thank you. Um, so, and I love the way you do the cold calls. It's like being back in, in school. And I think we should all say, Martha, that you know many of us are here today because of you. And your commitment to this, um, Vince, through both your leadership at Harvard Law School and elsewhere is profound. And uh, I think our entire profession owes a huge debt of gratitude for your leadership on this. So thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I think Ken said it exactly right. Corporations tend to believe that um, the rule of law is what anchors the public trust in us and that without trust, uh, we have no real ability to get done as corporate actors and citizens what we want. And so this morning when I was kind of having an argument, as I do, um, that's what passes for conversation in a household of mine with one lawyer husband and three uh, sons, um, about kind of why do corporations care? The question of if corporations ultimately care because it's in our self-interest is that actually good enough for caring, right? And does that really evince a deep commitment uh, to the rights of poor people and to serving justice? And of course, I went from Pfizer to a company that has all of you know seven employees now, where I'm the CEO of a tiny startup uh, in Cambridge. And I think at Pfizer, we had a deep commitment for many of the reasons Ken said, and I had a personal commitment as the general counsel, um, not just I'm looking at David, where we always supported um, Equal Justice Works and fellows and through our law firms. But the number of people who would come up to me and say, look, you know, I'm really busy. Can you just tell me how I can get out of jury duty? And I would say, as the general counsel, actually not. Uh, because one of the most important things that any of us can do as citizens is to serve on juries. And when we're trying cases, we want people just like you sitting on our juries. And access <laughs> is, and, and so I, I'm not often very sanctimonious as a lawyer, um, but I, I, got on, I, I got on my soapbox about that, and I started to think about that today. Um, because I do think ultimately it isn't just about corporations getting a level playing field because people trust the system and if people have access then they trust the system. I mean, I think that's true, but somehow that doesn't feel completely satisfying enough for me. Um, and ultimately I think we should all care about this because it's the right thing. Because as our ABA president said, it's kind of the daily grind and the indignities, right? And everybody deserves access to a life that isn't made harder because we're depriving people of access to just, justice and basic necessities. The kind of crime of not only can you not get to work um, to pay the things that are due, but now you actually are getting more fines because you're driving without a license that's been suspended. And I think um, as human beings, um, and ultimately corporations are just aggregations of human beings, um, we should care because we belong to the same world. And I'm really pleased to have been here today and thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. David Rubenstein is next, uh, one of the world's most outstanding civic leaders, philanthropists, founder of the Carlisle Group, leader, a leader of the World Economic Forum, uh, Library of Congress, Kennedy Center of the Arts, Harvard University, outstanding speaker at our 40th anniversary for the Legal Services Corporation. Uh, David, I so admire your deep knowledge uh, about and reverence for American history and its values. And I thank you for being in correspondence with my 90-year-old dad, who really enjoys it. He writes the best emails. Um, <laughs> he sends me emails. He reads the papers all the time and um, sends me things. He's very impressive. So I imagine what he was like when he was 45, uh, 90. Um, thank you for uh, being here, uh, inviting me to be here. Uh, some of you may be wondering why it takes seven business people to convince you that we care about um, <laughs> this subject. Um, it's not that they rounded up all seven business people who care about this subject in the United States, but um, the Da Vinci Code for why we're here is really this. Um, 
John Levy's father was the uh, president of the University of Chicago and also the former dean of the law school. John was raised at the, and went to lab school. And uh, we have, he sprinkled in here uh, three University of Chicago uh, trustees. So John and uh, Debbie and, uh, and uh, myself. And also you were raised in Chicago uh, as well. We've had diversity for a few others here, diversity for um, us. But really, it's uh, hidden that the University of Chicago is the leading place that cares about this issue. So everybody should know that. <laughs> Um, recently, um, I had the good fortune to uh, uh, go to the Supreme Court, and all of you have probably been to the United States Supreme Court, and uh, John Roberts was, Justice Roberts was giving me uh, a little tour of the place and explaining some things, uh, and he asked me, do you know where equal justice under the law, which is on the Supreme Court, comes from? I figured, uh-oh, I thought I knew a lot about legal documents. I'd say, did it come from the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights? He said, no, it actually came from the architect of the building. The architect was looking for something to put up there, and he kind of said, how about equal justice in the law? And he asked some of the justices, and they said, that sounds okay. <laughs> so uh, the truth is, um, equal justice under the law is what we haven't had. And uh, for most of our history, we haven't had it, and we still don't have it. Uh, the truth is, uh, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and Declaration of Independence were written by people who really didn't care about people who didn't have wealth. And now we have migrated uh, our society a bit to care more about people who don't have wealth, but we still are a long way away from that. Uh, the business community in the United States, I think, has more sensitivity to this issue than the business community in other countries, but we still are a long way away from what the legal profession has tried to do. Um, the business community, and I think business leaders, haven't gotten a good reputation in our most recent presidential campaign, and I suspect we will, those of us in the business community will have to atone for many of the sins that our, others in the business community have uh, uh, committed in this campaign about in terms of uh, our, our image. But I, I do think that the business community cares about this issue uh, for a couple reasons. One, uh, we're, business people are uh, humans as well. We're not just uh, an ogres who care about profit. And we care about living in a society where people have equal justice under the law and where everybody is treated fairly. And just because you have abandoned the practice of law, as I did because I wasn't good at it, and you've gone into the business world, doesn't mean you don't care about the same values you had when you were a lawyer or when you were, when you were in law school or when you were a student. So the business community, I think, can do a better job in the United States than it's done. But I think people in this audience, other people who might be listening to us, should recognize that business people don't abandon their concerns about social justice and equal justice on the law because they do worry about profits and losses and so forth. And we also worry in the business community that you cannot have a stable business community and you cannot have a good economic environment if you, have un, uh, you don't have the rule of law, you have a social unrest. And to the extent that the uh, people have um, a concern about income inequality and lack of justice to uh, for, for people of lower means, economic means, or the veterans and so forth, you're not going to have a stable society, you're not going to have a good economic community, and you're not going to be the envy of the world. Today, the United States in many areas is the, is the envy of the world, particularly in many areas of our, of our, our justice system, but not in all areas. And one of the ones we trail behind other countries that we should emulate is equal justice under law. And so to the extent that the business community can be motivated to recognize that we have a long way to go and that all of us have to do more to get our society society to care about the people who don't have uh, access to justice will be a better society, and that's why I care about it, and that's why I think the others here care about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, John Rogers, we are going to have another Chicago connection here. Um, thank you for being here. Um, one of the uh, most outstanding investors, You're, you are profiled in a book called The 99 Greatest Investors. Uh, you are a trustee of the University of Chicago uh, and also honored by your alma mater, Princeton, uh, with its highest award for uh, an alum. Founder of Ariel Investments, civic leader in Chicago and nationally. Uh, John Rogers is also an advocate for financial literacy, which frankly, if you can get that spread more through the country, it would actually prevent some of the consumer disasters and other problems that some of the clients that we have really face. So why do you care about legal services, access to justice, and if you are able to sneak in something about financial literacy, we would be delighted. Well, thank you. Um, I'll try to do both. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, it starts with how I got started with this, and, and John knows this. My mom graduated from the University of Chicago Law School in 1946, and her first job was with the Legal Aid Bureau of Chicago. 
and she would often, as I was growing up, talk about the importance of legal aid and how important it was to give back. At the same time, um, my grandfather, my mom's dad, was a lawyer, and my mom would also tell the story about how her grandfather, uh, C.F. Stratford, owned a hotel in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was burned down during the famous riots uh, in the 20s. And um, my great-grandfather escaped from uh, Tulsa, and uh, they were trying to extradite him back. And it was a real risk that if he came back to Tulsa that he'd be lynched in that time. And uh, my grandfather, again being a lawyer, was able to protect his father and actually save his life. And so my mom would always talk about the reason she became a lawyer was because she was able to see her dad save her grandfather's life. So that's kind of, you know, I think why John thought about me uh, for this. And uh, his father was at the UFC at the same time that my parents were there. Um, the second thing, you, know, you were nice to ask about financial literacy. My father was uh, the class of 48 at the UFC Law School and had, was a Tuskegee Airman and a fighter pilot in World War II. And uh, he started buying stocks for me as a young person, age 12, instead of birthday presents and Christmas presents. He thought it was important for me to learn about the markets. So what we've tried to do at Ariel is that we've, we've done a couple things. We started a small public school 20 years ago with Arnie Duncan when he worked at Ariel to give kids real investments. The 600 kids there get you know, a great financial literacy curriculum. But they also have a chance to invest in real stocks uh, with real money. And we do things like take them to the McDonald's annual meeting every year where I'm a board member, you know, bring them down and have a chance to talk to our analysts about careers in financial services. And uh, we also have another program that's uh, affiliated with the Big Shoulders Fund in Chicago where we have now 50 different Catholic and public schools have a financial literacy program uh, where they partner with various financial institutions around Chicago. So the reason I bring that up, I think that one of the great things about that is that the kids learn about having trust in our financial systems. They learn about our capitalist democracy. They think about career paths and financial services, and again, build this trust. So I think one of the things I think would be great is if we could find ways for more and more law firms to uh, partner with urban public schools and have the role models of lawyers there in the public schools talking about legal careers, learning about, again, our capitalist democracy and how it works in the three branches of government and all the things that would hopefully develop more trust in all of our systems, and maybe it would help to create a kind of environment that was more positive. Finally, as you know, in Chicago, we're all so uh, under stress because of the lack of trust in our police and in our justice system. And so I think if we can have lawyers there building relationships with inner city kids, maybe there'd be that more higher levels of trust and a better outcome for all of our communities. So thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Arnie Sorensen, President and CEO of Marriott International, which if you uh, didn't know, although I am a customer, uh, has lodging in 85 countries and territories. A leader in sustainability, diversity, public policy. Why are you here? Why do you care about this? Uh, why does it matter? Well, maybe just to pro prove that I'm not an entirely reformed lawyer, I'll, I'll pick an argument where one doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> which is, I guess, what lawyers like to do, right? So I want to talk li a little bit about why self-interest is actually an important motivating uh, factor here, not because I disagree with any of the words that have been said. And in fact, it's really special when self-interest drives you to a place which is also satisfying from a uh, social perspective and from a personal perspective, which uh, access to justice is certainly one of those areas. Uh, Marriott's been in business for about 90 years. Uh, the uh, founders started with a nine-stool root beer stand about two miles away from here, uh, A&W root beer stand. Uh, and famously, when the first cold weather came, they added chili dogs to the menu, and it became the hot shops. Uh, but from the beginning, uh, what they said was, take care of the associate, and the associate will take care of the customer, and the customer will come back again and again. Uh, we today are no longer really in the restaurant business unless restaurants are in hotels, but we have about 350,000 people around the world who wear our name badge every day. Uh, and they range from brand new employees who've never had jobs before to new immigrants uh, to very successful managers. Uh, and we depend on them to deliver the experience we need to deliver to our customers. Uh, think about that and think about the work that J.P. Morgan has done recently to assess how many of us are ready for a crisis in our lives financially. Uh, and this is not just a question about uh, the working poor. This is essentially the vast majority 
of uh, working people and middle class people who really do not have the resources to deal with an unexpected event, whether that be a legal event or some other event. Uh, and uh, those are the events that derail people. Uh, and uh, the, obviously the fewer resources anyone has, the easier it is to be derailed. You can be derailed by one of your kids being uh, nabbed and thrown in jail, by a divorce, uh, by a drug issue, by an issue with a landlord, uh, by an immigration issue maybe for a family member, uh, by a death in the family, uh, certainly by a health issue. Uh, all of these things are, uh, uh, can be career threatening uh, and obviously from our perspective, uh, cause us not maybe just to lose a, a, an associate, but have that associate totally distracted from their work. Uh, and so we have for years said, how do we make sure we're doing what we can? Of course, that's satisfying. Uh, and it's something that by itself we take enormous pride in saying, uh, look at the way that life has been transformed. But it also is essential that it be in our self-interest because, beca because it's in our self-interest, we can build programs where all of our associates can access, we call it uh, resources for life. Uh, it includes legal resources, but also financial resources and healthcare resources, where they can go and get a free legal service consultation uh, to figure out, do I need a lawyer? Obviously, we're not gonna set up our own law firm and uh, we wouldn't have the expertise nor the efficiency to do that well. But we can provide services to people who, so that they can say, this problem has just arisen in my life. What should I do about it? Uh, is this just a form? Can you get me a form? Uh, is this a regulatory matter? Can you help me file a, a form with the government for disability benefits, for example, which we do through our uh, health care provider too? Uh, but that ends up helping them through it, and it helps us too, uh, because it causes our people to be, uh, of course, more loyal to us, but even more important than that, much more engaged in the work that they've got to do and take pride in the growth of their careers, as opposed to uh, being unable to come to work or thinking every day, all day long while they're at work about the crisis which is consuming their lives. Well, thank you. And it's such a good reminder that legal needs are like health needs. They're essential for people being able to lead their lives, just uh, ordinarily. So thank you. Deborah Cafaro is identified by uh, the Harvard Business Review as one of the 50 best performing CEOs in America. She is the chair of Ventus Inc., which is a, a S&P 500 company with over 1,300 healthcare and senior living properties. She is on the board of the University of Chicago. <laughs> uh, and she is a leader in corporate governance and philanthropy, and she's going to get the question, why do you care? Why are you here? Thanks, uh, Dean Minow. It's really an honor to be here, and I'm a bit new to this, so I hope you'll forgive me. I will say that... Uh, it's well um, I'm really happy to talk with you they did not call on us at the university they didn't tell us they were going to call on us at the so University of Chicago exactly so it was always uh, we had to be on our, our tiptoes anyway I grew up as a working class kid in Pittsburgh and and I think I understood from a very early age how important it is that people get a fair shake and I think that uh, in when I was growing up it was easier to get a fair shake than it is today and uh, I do think legal cert, getting a fair shake, an important component of that is access to justice. And so what you do at legal services really enables, I think, more people to feel like they have a fair, fair shake, which enables, of course, our democracy to function and for people to have trust in the system. I would say what I see in my business as a large owner of senior living and healthcare assets is a huge number of seniors and veterans who would be entitled to many benefits and services and uh, the ability to access both the healthcare system and other kinds of benefits who are completely unable to do so because they don't have anyone to help them navigate through the system. Um, and the last thing I would say is as a, as a parent, I have a disabled daughter and um, she's developmentally disabled and I see a lot of her peers who um, are indigent and who don't have the resources that our family does. And those families are utterly bereft in terms of being able to find educational solutions, being able to 
access, again, benefits and navigate the health care system. And obviously it is the right thing to do to provide resources to that community to enable them to, to have a full life and be citizens. And, and that's obviously also great for our democracy and great for our economy, be able to hold jobs and be productive members of society. So that's why I'm here today in addition to Mr. Levy. Thank you, and I'm so glad that you are, and those are wonderful points. Brad Smith, President of Microsoft, uh, leader uh, around the country. You've been described as the de facto ambassador for the tech industry at large, says the New York Times. Mm -hmm. uh, civic leader, kids in need of defense, uh, chairing the Leadership Council of Legal Diversity. I have been told that you were the first attorney at Covington and Burling who made it a condition of joining, uh, taking a job there, that you had a PC on your desk. Is that true? That is true. Uh, and, <laughs> and Brad Smith, you are a, a real hero of mine. I'm so glad you're here. Well, I also want to say I have twice visited the University of Chicago, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> so I feel very comfortable with all of you. Um, rather than echo the very good words that I think so many people have offered about why business cares, I, I think another interesting question to think about is, why should anyone else care about whether business cares good. about this issue? Uh, and I think people should. Because at bottom, what we're talking about is a legal challenge that I think is fundamentally an economic problem. There is a mismatch between supply and demand of legal services on a persistent basis for a very important part of the population. It is a gap that the free market will not close. People don't have the money to buy these services. It is a gap that, at least in its entirety, government support will not close. So how will we close this gap? And I think in addition to everything else, it really calls for an innovation imperative. Uh, I think it calls for legal innovation, but also business process, business model, and technology innovation. Um, just think about the examples we've heard about this afternoon. When you allow someone of low income to file an affidavit in lieu of paying a fine, that represents legal innovation that actually changes the curve of demand for additional legal services. When you take training and you automate it, you take a part of the legal process that a business person would say is a business process and then you use technology innovation to reduce the cost and frankly reduce the barrier to entry. A lot of what we've done with kids in need of defense is it try to innovate around the business model to create a new public-private partnership that involves some government financial support, a model built around people who are permanent, uh, in effect, legal aid employees with lots of volunteers. In this, at this point, 329 law firms, companies, law schools, and bar associations. And when I look at the future, at where technology is going, when I listen to Mark and think about pro bono net, the great untapped opportunity for the next two decades, frankly, is around technology. Whether it's around taking other processes like translation. So many people speak different languages, and yet I know with our Skype translator, we could have an English-speaking lawyer speak with a Spanish-speaking client. Or you take that intake example that Jim was describing and how that has been automated, and I, when I think about where machine learning is going to go and natural language interfaces, None of this is a panacea, but we can do so much more. And I think it fundamentally brings me to the last thing I think a lot about, which you heard about a moment ago. Why is it as lawyers that we are so generous, and yet I think we quite rightly feel underappreciated? I think part of the answer is this. As lawyers, we spend a lot of our time talking to other lawyers. We need to spend more of our time talking to people who are not lawyers. We need to spend more of our time listening to and learning from people who are not lawyers. And more than anything else, we need to enlist people who are not lawyers in helping us surmount this fundamental legal challenge. So powerfully said. You know, I <laughs> Uh, Arnie figured out that lawyers can create an uh, argument when there isn't one. 
uh, and Brad reframed the question to answer a better one. Um, I, I would just say that we had one more question, which I've been told we don't have time to address, but you began to address, uh, Brad, and uh, I, I guess I would leave this as the ask to everybody. How can we, who care about this issue, which you have demonstrated so powerfully, better connect with people who can help solve the issue? which I think will be people outside of the way lawyers think about how you do it. Because lawyers actually have come up with business models that are not working, and with court systems that charge fees that put poor people in a death uh, spiral, and we need to talk with other people. And I actually think that the people who are here represent the kind of talent and knowledge and innovation that would make a big difference. And I know many, many of you, of you are already collaborating with people on technology, on business systems, um, and it does require some humility that we will not solve this problem without collaborating with other people. Uh, with apologies uh, to our amazing panel for not getting to the rest of our questions, uh, we do thank the Vice President for his appearance, but he took our time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask everyone to, th to join me in thanking our panel. I'm going to ask Brad Smith to save one minute. Um, everybody, please. And so Brad Smith, Jim Sandman, um, and, and also Mark O'Brien, please come on up. Thank you. This is the surprise announcement. Uh, I am thrilled to be able to announce that Microsoft has committed at least one million dollars. Wow. <laughs> You're giving him ideas. This is making me nervous. <laughs> and its project management expertise to create the very first statewide online access to civil justice portal. This follows up on a recommendation of the Technology Summit that LSC convened a few years ago, the idea of the portal is that there would be a single online point of entry for anyone seeking help with a civil legal need. It will draw together all of the players in the civil legal justice community, the courts, legal services providers, pro bono lawyers, existing technology, online training videos, and it will use uh, triage technology to direct the person to the most appropriate level of effective service under the circumstances, taking account of things like the nature of the matter, the capacity of the client, whether the opponent is represented, what's at stake. This will be done with state-of-the-art internet and cloud technology. It will be standards compliant. It will be accessible from any device, and it will be open source so that anybody can replicate it. And the idea is that this will be a pilot that we then hope can be used nationwide to transform access to justice. Thank you, Brad Smith, and thank you, Microsoft. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, 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 I should mention the partnership. With I just want to mention the partnership with Mark and Pro Bono Net and, and, and just say, what I think we have the opportunity to do, and our real goal here is to create the foundation for a new era of technology innovation uh, by creating open source platforms that anybody can build on, can be localized for any state, and I hope more than anything else that we can enlist a new generation of engineers to work with us so that we can create technology that will help close this gap. So we very much look forward to working together. Thank you. Sorry, I'm up again. <laughs> uh, I'd now like to, am I ready? Uh, to introduce Neil Eggleston, the White House Counsel. Neil has had a remarkable uh, career in law, uh, both in public service and in private practice. He clerked for Chief Justice Berger. He was an assistant United States attorney for many years. He was special counsel, to, he was counsel to a House special uh, committee. He was associate counsel in the White House in the 1990s, and he has been White House Counsel since 2014. Please welcome Neil Eggleston.
Thanks uh, to everyone here. I'm here to introduce uh, your next speaker, Loretta Lynch, although I just told her I was going to spend a few minutes talking about the president before I got around to her, and she thought that was okay. So I hope it's okay with all of you as well. I especially want to thank uh, John uh, Levy and Rebecca Furtick Cohen for their work in organizing these discussions. I, uh, I took a, I, I was unable, I'm sorry, to be here earlier today, but I took a look at the, the sort of the agenda for the day, and I'm particularly sad that I missed the, the panel on fees and fines, because that's, and I'm uh, sorry, I'm sure the people here participated in it, that's been an area of interest of mine really since I got involved with the Policing Task Force in Ferguson. Uh, the Department of Justice, as I'm sure now everyone knows, has done some really terrific work on that uh, recently with a letter going out. And it's, it's as, about as important a, a work that people do. It's just a way that people get enmeshed into the system and they just cannot get their way out of it. And so the work that was done, and I'm sure that the, the discussion earlier today was really important on that subject, and I, I thank all of you for being so involved in it. Um, the issue of making our justice system fairer is really critically important to the President of the United States. I talk to him about this uh, issue a lot. He's committed to ensuring that we have a balanced and equitable justice system. It's something that he has demonstrated over the course of this administration. It's why he signed into law the Fair Sentencing Act, which was bipartisan legislation that reduced sentencing disparity between powder cocaine and crack cocaine offenses. It's why he directed Ban the Box, um, which is a step the administration has recently taken for federal positions. And I know a number of, uh, I can't remember whether it includes Microsoft actually, but I know a number of companies have also adopted this uh, recently, which essentially delays asking about prior uh, prosecutions and convictions until much later in the interview process. This has done a lot uh, to help the formerly incarcerated get back into society because if they come out and they can't get a job, their ability to get their lives together and not get back into prison is significantly reduced. So that's been a very significant uh, uh, sort of action. The President has done what he can with the federal government, but I want to thank uh, industry which has also uh, embraced that enormously, and we're very appreciative of that. It's also why the President asked the Department of Justice to review the overuse of solitary confinement across U.S. prison systems, resulting in important reforms that will accept, uh, affect some 10,000 federal prisoners who are held in restrictive housing. It's also why he established a task force on 21st century policing, which developed concrete recommendations to enhance trust between our men and women in law enforcement and the communities that they serve. And it's also why we've been working so hard and are continuing to work very hard, talked about it with the President today, on sensible criminal justice reform that will make our system more fair and more effective. The President also made clear that he cares about using the authority granted him under the Constitution to achieve fair treatment of people who have previously received disproportionate sentences in the criminal justice system. This is the clemency initiative that you've heard a fair amount about that the President is also enormously committed to. I'm spending a lot of my personal time on it. I'm the last stop between the recommendation uh, and the President, and we're continuing to work on that. We've seen a number he's already given, issued more clemencies than the last five or six Presidents combined, and we're, you know, sort of, we're only in April. We got a lot of time left, and there are going to be a lot more coming. The President has also shown his commitment to a balanced and responsible criminal justice system by nominating Merrick Garland to sit on the Supreme Court. Chief Judge Garland has been serving the public for virtually his entire career. As a lawyer in private practice at Arnold and Porter, Chief Judge Garland handled several significant pro bono cases. After making partner, Chief Judge Garland made the unusual choice to accept a line level job as a federal prosecutor serving his community by investigating and prosecuting gang, gang violence and corrupt prox prosecution, or prosec uh, public, I'm sorry, corrupt uh, politicians. That was right here in Washington, D.C. He then moved to the Department of Justice where he oversaw some of the most significant prosecutions in the 1990s, including the Oklahoma City, bo city bombing, uh, always taking pains to do everything by the book. Today is actually the anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing. And he is in his 19 years of service on the bench. He's demonstrated an unwavering commitment to the rule of law, forging consensus among strong-minded judges on that court on both ends of the spectrum, while still taking the time to tutor uh, students at a local elementary school and mentor dozens of law clerks 
<laughs> excuse me, many of them women who have gone on to pursue careers in public service themselves. And finally, turning back to Attorney General Lynch, he has uh, proven his commitment to these fundamental issues of fairness by naming Loretta Lynch to be the Attorney General. She is a true leader who is fighting every day to keep us safe and to improve our criminal justice system. After graduating from Harvard Law School and a period in private practice, Loretta joined the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York. I might say I was an assistant in the Southern District of New York. It's uh, only a uh, uh, river apart, but the rivalry is intense. <laughs> um, she forged an impressive career prosecuting cases involving narcotics, violent crime, public corruption, and civil rights. In 1999, President Clinton appointed her to lead the office as the U.S. Attorney. She served in that position until 2001 and then went back to Hogan and Hartson. While at Hogan, she performed extensive pro bono work for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was established to prosecute individuals responsible for the human rights violations arising out, the, out of the genocide in Rwanda. In 2010, President Obama asked her to resume her leadership at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn. Under her direction, the office successfully prosecuted numerous corrupt uh, public officials, terrorists, cyber criminals, and human traffickers. And now she's been on the job as the Attorney General for about a year. I think we're just about at her anniversary. Under her leadership, the department has continued to be a strong voice and a leader on the critical issues that all of you have been discussing today. And um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the 83rd Attorney General of the United States, Loretta Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> it was easy to hear. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. That's okay for a full day, but I think this crowd's got more energy. Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. We got a lot of work to do, so we got to keep up our energy. So uh, thank you so much for making some time for me here at the end of, of your day. I want to thank Neil for that kind introduction. Uh, Neil did tell me, he said, I'm here to introduce you, but I'm going to talk about the president. Uh, and I said, look, always lead with the big guy, you know? <laughs> but the reason why that is not only OK with me, but I think the perfect tone uh, with which to set this ending commentary is because, as with every initiative, all the things we do, the commitment comes from the top. And when you have that commitment from the top of any organization, whether it's the administration, whether it's the Department of Justice, a U.S. Attorney's Office, or a company, as we have seen, that is when you see real change. And that is when everyone builds it into their own models of accountability and productivity and the things that they do. And I, and I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to work in this administration and have so many partners, uh, not just Neil and his, his other colleagues at the White House Counsel's Office, but my colleagues throughout the administration and other agencies, and of course in the Oval Office itself, who are truly, deeply, bone deep dedicated to this issue. This issue of fundamental fairness cuts through, I hope you see, everything or so many things that this administration has focused on over the years, from access to health care to access to legal care. Uh, the idea that individuals ought to have a pathway to, in fact, exercise their fundamental rights. It's not novel. It's not new. But this administration is working to make it real, and I'm tremendously proud to be a part of it. So you all have had a great day. I, too, have seen the agenda. I've been quite impressed by it and had the ability to watch a part of the last panel uh, from the green room over there uh, in the back, you know, from which we always emerge from behind the curtain to the all of the crowd. Uh, but let me thank everyone who's worked so hard to put this panel together. I see my dean, Martha Minow, who's here. Uh, led the panel. I know that uh, John Levy's here. I know Jim, Jim Sandman is here. The leadership of the Legal Services Corporation over the last several years has been groundbreaking. You've led us in new directions. You have focused on the core mission of providing legal services while also making sure that you embrace the new technology uh, offered by Microsoft and others, and you embrace the new ideas, and that you truly listen to the people whose needs you are trying to serve. And, and that's actually nothing short of revolutionary. So I thank all of you for that. 
and for your commitment there. There's some colleagues of mine from the Department of Justice whom you've seen earlier today, Lisa Foster and her team at the Office of Access to Justice. Uh, they work every day, uh, all day and well into the night, to broaden opportunity, uh, to, to expand horizons for people who don't always think of government as the place they should turn to for help. And Lisa and her team work very, very hard to change that. And so I, I thank them every day for all that they do. All of your speakers today, um, I particularly am sorry that I missed, as Neil indicated, the earlier panels. Uh, and I know that you had Congressman Kennedy here earlier. And Congressman Kennedy and Congressman Brooks have organized the first Access to Civil Legal Services Caucus in the House. And I meet with the different caucuses regularly to talk about their different, different points of interest and focuses. And this, I think, is one that I think is going to expand and grow and pull in members from across the aisle uh, and from all ranges of experience. But the caucus that focuses on access to civil legal services, recognizing that this, too, is one of government's fundamental missions. Uh, and, and I was actually privileged to hear about the Microsoft announcement. Brad, that is groundbreaking. I think to marry technology and the law in a way that helps, uh, in a way that expands access to justice for so many people is really going to be the model of things to come. I tell you, I actually first heard of this model of using online resources uh, when I was in Rwanda last fall talking to the Minister of Justice there, and of course, in a country that only 22 years ago was completely devastated and saw their legal system in particular completely devastated, they've had to focus on innovative ways to, to make sure that people in far-flung areas have access to justice, and they've, they've, they're using uh, kiosks and automated kiosks there as well. And I remember thinking, this is something that, that uh, we need one of our great American companies to pick up and do, and of course, there, there is Brad, uh, and is, as you are in so many ways, uh, partnering with the legal profession and with these ideas and bridging that gap. Um, and it just, I think it's just such a tremendous testament to your team there, and so I thank you for all of that. And thanks to all of you who have come here together today to talk about, to think about, to plan, to build on all of these great ideas, to support the mission of the Legal Services Corporation, which is so fundamental to the tenets of our great society. And of course, that mission is nothing less than the fulfillment of one of our fundamental promises to every American, the promise, the conviction, the commitment that in the United States, here in this country, every single person should be equal under the law. But of course, as you all know and as you have discussed, for far too many Americans, justice is a commodity that they feel they can't afford rather than a right, a fundamental birthright to which they are entitled. And in this country, in this time, and particularly in this administration, that is unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. We can't have it. Inadequate access to justice can devastate families. It damages communities. And even worse, it erodes Americans' trust in our institutions of government and law. And realistically, how can you expect someone to trust their government when they can't even get in the courthouse door to be heard. Or if they do, they find that the justice system that's supposed to be free and open and working for them is trying to charge them some kind of entrance fee. How can you expect that kind of trust? And without that essential trust, as we have seen in so many areas of modern life, people are literally adrift. People are alone. They are without support at some of the most difficult times of their lives. And when they look out for help, and when they look for someone to have their back, Legal Services Corporation is there. And so I thank you so much for always, always extending a hand and fulfilling that commitment. This forum itself is part of that commitment. And so it's a wonderful thing that you do every year. And I'm, again, thankful that you've asked me to spend a few minutes with you. Now, people here today are coming from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of experiences. Uh, and I thought the last panel was so fascinating in all of the different responses to the issue of why is this an important question? How does it tie into financial services? How does it tie into the business community? How does it tie into the tech community? But what I thought as I was listening, what struck me was that the common thread among all of the vaunted and, and so wonderful business leaders that I heard was their connection to the human capital that is still the essence of every enterprise in this country. 
And without the protection of that human capital, without investment in that human capital, without the growth of that human capital, these organizations will not grow and thrive and be the leaders that they need to be into the 21st and even 22nd century. Now, there are also so many people here from other areas who have focused on this issue also. We have judges here. I know so many chief judges are here. Uh, who are really, really focused on making sure that their courtrooms are open and accessible to everyone. Uh, our legal aid lawyers who are here in the trenches every day. I will tell you that some of my most fulfilling moments when I was in private practice was when I was proud to serve on the board of the Legal Aid Society of New York and the Federal Defenders Society uh, also in New York, working with those lawyers to make sure they had the resources they need to carry out this essential mission. And now that I'm at the Department of Justice, I am tremendously proud to stand with all of you. Every group here has such an important role to play in this inspiring work. And we are determined to continue to do our part as well, to fight alongside with you for the rights of our most vulnerable citizens. And that's why we took to heart your recommendation stemming from an earlier conversation that we've had on this very issue our December 2015 convening on the issue of fees and fines and access to justice. And one of the recommendations that we received from this group was that the department work on providing greater clarity to our state and local co uh, court partners regarding their legal obligations with respect to fees and fines and to share best practices in this area. And I want you to know that we took that to heart. And just last month, we provided that information to court systems around the country and we look forward to working closely with you on the other recommendations made, both at that time and the recommendations that will come out of today's convening as well. But that's also why we're looking to the future, because even though justice is a birthright, in order to ensure that we can dispense justice, of course, we need resources. And that is why we have proposed a number of new initiatives in, in the President's fiscal 2017 budget request. Yes, we have hope that there will be a budget in 2017. <laughs> I'm new to Washington, I can still have hope. <laughs> These uh, initiatives that we're supporting include grants that would allow states to improve the delivery of legal services. It includes funding to establish a civil legal aid research institute. And it's why we also strongly support the President's fiscal 2017 budget request for the Legal Services Corporation. And that request for 2017 at $475 million is $90 million more than Congress appropriated this year. The need is real. The need is deep. And we know that you are effective stewards of this money on behalf of the people who truly need these resources. LSC is the backbone of civil legal assistance throughout the United States. And I am urging Congress to fund it at a level that reflects this tremendous importance to the creation of the more equal country that all of us strive to serve. Now, of course, as in our efforts to expand legal aid, we're so proud to partner with Legal Services Corporation, but we also rely on partners from across the federal government. And in my role as Attorney General, I am tremendously proud to co-chair the White House Legal Aid Interagency Round Table, which bears, of course, the rather unfortunate acronym of LAIR. <laughs> because everything in D.C. has an acronym. Uh, but it's staffed by the Office for Access to Justice, Lisa Foster's office, and it brings together 21 different federal agencies in an effort to identify and enhance legal aid opportunities. Because, as we've also discussed, sometimes in the discussions that we have on this issue, talking just lawyer to lawyer, we think in a, in a linear, lawyer to lawyer way, and we can miss what's right under our nose. That's a very real need of someone uh, for, for access to legal justice. And so many federal programs depend upon access to justice in order to make their promise real. Now, the President re recently recognized the importance of Lair's work by elevating it to the level of a White House initiative last September, September of 2015. And it is going to be a tremendous resource, we think. Uh, and through that, as well as through the Reentry Council, we're identifying numerous barriers just to everyday life that people could use the assistance of lawyers in, in order to surmount. Not just housing, but employment. 
uh, employment discrimination or just help in knowing whether or not there is a claim. And learning and people who are coming back into society will often need legal assistance in determining whether or not they're eligible for certain grants and jobs. And when that assistance is provided across the board, we see services being utilized at a higher rate. We see people uh, actually taking advantage of all the benefits of American life. Now also, with the Corporation for National and Community Service, We've joined with them with our Elder Justice Initiative and our Office for Victims of Crime. Together, this tripartite group has recently launched what we're calling Elder Justice AmeriCorps. Now, Elder Justice AmeriCorps is a grant program. It is going to expand the capacity of local legal aid programs to specifically address elder abuse and neglect and exploitation because we are seeing this on the rise. And because, of course, our elderly citizens, those who raised us, and those whom we should seek to honor every day deserve to live in safety and dignity. Some of our other partners are the Department of Labor. And we're working with the Department of Labor to help establish the National Clean Slate Clearinghouse. And this is going to help local legal aid programs and public defenders and reentry service providers improve their ability to help clients clean their records and expunge their records where they have the right to do that because Americans with criminal records deserve a meaningful second chance in life, and because all of us deserve to be seen as more than the worst thing that we have ever done. And this fall, we're going to roll out the first annual report to the President on Lair's progress. And this document, is going to, this document is going to detail the series of programs and initiatives, some of which I've mentioned just now, but it's going to outline everything that we're working on that will also include a legal aid component. Now, this work must go on. And I know that we have several Chief Justices who have been here throughout the day. And I want you to know that I stand with you and your colleagues and the Conference of Chief Justices in your commitment to provide meaningful and appropriate legal services to every person with an essential legal aid need. You see it all, the homeowners who are struggling to avoid foreclosure, the survivors of domestic violence who are seeking protective orders the parents who are fighting for custody of their children, and the veterans who have defended our rights overseas only to be denied their rights here at home. So many situations which cry out for legal assistance across the board. So many of our fellow Americans who deserve protection. So many people to whom we have a responsibility to act. And of course, it's this responsibility, this belief, that led Congress to create the Legal Services Corporation in 1974. And it's that conviction that all of us here today in this room and beyond are reaffirming today. And although we still have a long way to go, it is true, before every American is truly equal under the law, I am tremendously encouraged by the progress that we have made. And I am confident that with the devotion and the commitment of everyone in this room, we will continue to advance toward the United States in which every individual in every community sees the door to the courthouse as truly open and where liberty and justice belong to all. So thank you for letting me spend a few minutes with you here today. Thank you for putting this wonderful forum together. Simply, I know, to pause in your work, to get together and collect new ideas and new initiatives. And thank you so much for what you're about to do, which is go forth from this gathering and continue the work that truly makes America great, bringing America home to everyone on our beloved shores. So thank you so very, very much for your work and your caring and your commitment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Attorney General, for your own commitment. Thank you, all of you, for being with us this afternoon. We reconvene, for most of us, in a few minutes up at the Supreme Court. I think Becky said we have to run to the, to the bus, walk briskly. Now, what, where do we go? Okay, thank you all, and uh, we will see you up on the court. <laughs>